Morning, friends. Welcome to worship. I'm seeing a few people I haven't seen in a long time. Welcome back. So glad that you're here this morning. If you're a first-time guest, we have a special gift for you after this service. If you'll just check in at the welcome desk out those doors or right outside those doors and let them know that you are visiting with us for the first time, they have a little something special to give you. Also, if everyone will find the red covered pew pads and record your attendance this day so that we know that you're here. We appreciate that. I want to call your attention to the back of the bulletin. You will see all our top announcements there. The one I want to call your attention to today is number three. This afternoon at two o'clock in here in the sanctuary, we have a concert at two o'clock with Luca and I'm not even going to try, Marinkovic. So you'll want to hear that. It sounds like the music will be incredible. And then there is another one on Saturday, September the 28th, or September 18th at 7.30. So keep those in mind as you go about your day. And now, my friends, let us join together in worship by standing in body or spirit and singing together hymn 159, Lift High the Cross.
let us continue in worship stating what it is we say we believe using the Apostles' Creed. Please join me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. This is just an important day in the life of our church as we come this day in remembering in our prayers those who received their Bibles today as third graders. I remember receiving my own third grade Bible, which I had with me in our nine o'clock service today. The inscription reads, presented to David Melton by the Women's Society for Christian Service, which is the, con the precursor to the United Methodist Women. Uh, from Shiloh Methodist Church in Granite Quarry, North Carolina, October the 7th, 1962. That Bible is with me and has been with me throughout that time, and what a precious gift it is for us as a church to present people with the living Word of God. And so this day we pray for all the third graders who have received their Bibles this day and for all of us who were third graders at one time and received God's great gift to us. Let us remember them in our prayers. Also, we want to remember this day and express our Christian love and sympathy to Sean and Amy Penn on the death of Sean's father, Tom Penn, on September the 4th, grandfather of Charlie and Catherine. To Bruce and Lynn Feynman on the death of Bruce's father, Bud, on September the 5th, grandfather of Courtney, Emmy, and Jenna. to Lynn Bird on the death of her husband, Noah, on September the 8th. Noah was a longtime member of our chancel choir, and obviously they are in mourning today, and we join with them in the loss of Noah. And to Jack and Carol Head on the death of Jack's nephew this past week, cousin of Elizabeth Lambach. Now let's go to God in prayer as we spend a time as silent prayer as we lift before God our personal concerns, followed by our pastoral prayer and our Lord's Prayer. O oh, most holy God, we confess how difficult it is for us to tame our tongues at time. We lay before you this day words that we wish we could unspeak. Silence kept when we should have said something. Our double speak and our inconsistencies. All the talk we have done behind other people's backs. All the chatter that has torn people down every confidence that we have broken, and every word that our words have inflicted pain. We pray that you will bridle our loosened tongues and help us to think before we speak. Guide us to use our words to build people up and to not tear them down. Help our tongues to lead us to maturity and our faithfulness to you. Oh God, it has been an emotional weekend for us as we remember the events of September the 11th, 2001, 
Years have passed, but we have not forgotten. Let our hearts remember those who gave and those who continue to give their lives for our freedom. But also let our hearts find a posture of peace for our nation and for our world. Let us be mindful to pray for peace and to invite your spirit to continue to guide us as we pray this day. The prayer that your son taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Good morning. That's better. And welcome to Third Grade Bible Sunday. My name is Jennifer Dees. I'm one of our children's team. Each of our third graders will receive a personalized Bible with an inscription and signed by each of our clergy. Is it not working? Oh, I'm, I forgot I can take this off. 
There we go. That's better, right? Okay. We'll start over. I'm Jennifer Dees. I'm a member of our children's team. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to Third Grade Bible Sunday. So each of our third graders will be receiving a personalized Bible with an inscription and signed by each of our clergy. By third grade, our students have become independent readers. And if you've talked to them, you know that they're doing some pretty in-depth critical thinking. So we like to take this chance to make sure that they each have their own Bible to help them grow and connect with God. With that said, let's get started. I'm gonna call each of our students up by name and they're gonna come up and receive their Bible from Pastor Phil. Uh, and then we are gonna open all of our Bibles together. Caroline Faluco. Jackson Hagar. Miles Lane. Andrew Madison. Cannon Wright. And then I also want to recognize our third graders who weren't able to be here today. Ander Beard. Candler Collins, Finley Maddox, Thomas Mua, Emery Post, and Natalie Stallings. Okay, so now that each of you is holding your Bible, we're going to unwrap them together. So each Bible is wrapped in four special layers, and we're going to unwrap each layer one at a time, so you can understand the complexity of the book, book that you're holding. The first layer is white. It reminds us that this is not an ordinary book. It's a book that comes from God, and the wisdom we find within it is meant to lead us to purer and godlier lives. And so it is a book that is sacred. So you can take that first layer off. Yeah, just like you're ripping up a Christmas present. I don't think y'all unwrap these birthday presents and Christmas presents this easily. Okay, our second layer is notebook paper. So this is a book that helps you learn. Write notes in it, mark your favorite parts, look for new things you never knew about yourself and God before. So y'all can take off that notebook paper. This, this layer is a lot easier. Okay, our third layer is cartoon paper. Cartoons tell us stories, and the Bible is full of stories. Its stories belong to all of us, and these words speak to us all. They tell us who we are. They tell us what we that we belong to one another, for we are the people of God. All right, so unwrap that layer. <laughs> we, we did have the option of a lot more layers. We only chose four. The last layer is brown paper. Its color represents the age of the, wisdom, the, of the wisdom in the Bible as the words and stories in this book have been passed down for hundreds or even thousands of years. We cannot wait to see how this wisdom will lead you as you grow and learn. So unwrap that last layer and you can see your Bible. Okay, now if you'll turn back around and if you'll kneel, Ms. Charlotte is going to lead us in a prayer.
my mic on. Me. We'll just let the we'll just let my mask hang here. Will you all please pray? And then congregation, let's bow our heads as we pray for our third graders. Oh Almighty God, we are thankful that we are a church that equips our students with the word. Powerful God, may our third graders hold tightly to their Bibles. May they become further invested and excited in the hope that's found in the Bible's words. May we all remember that our Bible is not an ordinary book, but that it imparts wisdom and security as we live our lives. May we all be reminded that our Bible is a place for notes, growth, and even learning. And may we be reminded that the Bible is full of such incredible stories that tell us who we are, how our lives are continually and positively changed, that tells us that we have the joy of living in community, that tells us we have the opportunity and joy to give, and stories that tell us that not only do we meet Jesus, but that others meet Jesus through us. May we be reminded of the age of wisdom held within the words of the Bible. And God, as we witness to the continuing work of your kingdom, we celebrate the movement of your word in all of our lives, specifically in our third graders' lives. God, as our third graders begin this incredible journey of further understanding your love, grace, and mercy in the depths of these words, be with them and be with us as we witness the individual calls you have placed upon all our lives, as well as the communal call you have placed upon this church body. O oh, masterful God, may this be a day of celebration, and may our third graders keep your word close, and may we, as a church, be reminded to keep your word close. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you guys. You can turn, return and sit with your parents.
Amen. You may be seated. As we give thanks for third grade Bibles and those who receive them, I think of both David and Matt. Matt continues to preach from his third grade Bible, so I don't know which one of you is going to become a preacher, but you may want to start thinking about that and hold on to that third grade Bible for a long time. The way that we were able to connect with our folks who were receiving third grade Bibles was through our new software, Dunwoody Community Builder. And if you have not had a chance to pick up one of these cards and edit your profile, I hope you will do that in the way, in the days ahead, as the way that we continue to stay connected to each other and connect more fully with God. What do I like about a good tongue twister? It's hard to say. You remember the classics like rubber baby buggy bumpers. Try that one. That's not too bad. One of my favorites was always toy boat. Toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. Try it 10 times fast. It kind of degenerates as it goes along. The people at MIT studied the toughest tongue twisters, and they came up with this one. Pad kid, poured curd, pulled cod. It doesn't seem like too much on the surface. Pad kid, poured curd, pulled cod. But they said that if anybody could actually get through it 10 times, the researchers would give them a prize. People started on this one, and usually about halfway through, they just stopped talking altogether. <laughs> Pad kid, poured curd, pulled cod. Pad kid, poured curd, pulled cod. Pad could put. Our tongues can get us into trouble, can't they? Our tongues can trip us up and get us to say things that we really don't want to say. And Steven Solberg put it this way, the comedian, he said, we want to think of our tongues as outside of ourselves, that it's not we who are speaking, but our tongues who are doing the damage. And he gives this illustration. He said, do you ever get a kernel of popcorn stuck in your teeth and your tongue then has a mind of its own? You know it's there and you've said to your tongue, we're going to floss when we get home. We're going to floss, but the tongue's like, I got it. I got it. And you say to your tongue, just leave it alone. This is what floss was invented for. We're going to floss when we get home. And the tongue is like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Let me touch it. And then after several hundred times, the tongue just seems to have a mind of its own. The tongue won't let it go. James is concerned about our tongues in his letter today. James is concerned about the people of God who do not use their tongues to edify, do not use their tongues to build up and to build community, but people who use their tongues to tear down, to hurt, and to maim. And because of that, he's quite concerned. Karen Amon, who I'll talk about a little bit more later, has written a book called Keep It Shut. Y'all like that? Keep it shut. And that book, Keep It Shut, makes the notation that there are 3,500 references in the Bible to tongue and speech. So God must be incredibly concerned about what we say and what we do not say. So I'm going to ask the third graders to help me, especially today. Will you turn to the book of James in your common English Bible? We're going to be reading from the CEB today. And will one of my third graders tell me what page that's on? James chapter 3, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans, and Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. Very good. You got it. So what page is it on? 1360? It's 1361. There are a lot of pages in these Bibles, aren't there? 1,361. So I'm going to ask the third graders to stand with me with their Bibles, and I'm going to read from my common English Bible. Mine's a little bigger than yours, and I'm going to read from that today, and I'm going to read James, the third chapter, and if you will stand and read along with me, that would be great. And you can read out loud if you want to, or read it to yourself, whatever you'd like to do. 
My brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers because we know that teachers will be judged more strictly. We all make mistakes often, but those who don't make mistakes with their words have reached full maturity. Like a bridled horse, they can control themselves entirely. When we bridle horses and put bits in their mouths to lead them wherever we want, we can control their whole bodies. Consider ships. They are so large that strong winds are needed to drive them. But pilots direct their ships wherever they want with a little rudder. In the same way, even though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts wildly. Think about this. A small flame can set a whole forest on fire. The tongue is a small flame of fire, a world of evil at work in us. It contaminates our entire lives. Because of it, the circle of life is set on fire. The tongue itself is set on fire by the flames of hell. People can tame and already have tamed every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish. No one can tame the tongue, though. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we both bless the Lord and Father and curse human beings made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come from the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, it just shouldn't be this way. Both fresh water and salt water don't come from the same spring, do they? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree produce olives? Can a grapevine produce figs? Of course not. And fresh water doesn't flow from a salt water spring either. This is the challenging good news from the book of James. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for these ancient words written to a community that was dispersed across the world. Help us to hear these words for us today. Be with our third graders as the Bible becomes a part of who they are. And be with us now as we take a moment of silence to let these words sink into our minds, reminding us of the moment of silence at 8.46 a.m. yesterday. May we take this moment of silence and allow James' words to embed themselves in us. Gracious God, may these moments of silence be time not just to remember, but to hear your word afresh in our hearts and in our minds. We pray for these third graders, for the word of God that they will be reading and learning in the days ahead. Help your word to be part of their everyday life. In your name we pray. Amen. There have been times when my tongue has betrayed me. There's t been times when my tongue has said and done things that have gotten me into trouble. Amen? I have to tell you that my tongue recently betrayed me because I thought all the different kinds of Fruit Loops were different flavors. Turns out, Fruit Loops are all the same flavor, they're just a different color. Can you believe that? My tongue told me the wrong story. My brain looked at those different colors and told me that they were different flavors, but they're all the same flavor. Our tongue is an amazing muscle. In fact, it is the one muscle that never seems to get tired. Can I get a witness? 
In fact, the reason is because it's not just one muscle, it is eight muscles working together. Eight muscles working together, and they often are at work even when we don't know it. When trouble happens is often when you see the tongue. In some areas of Tibet, sticking out your tongue is a sign of respect and greeting. Try it. I see you pulling down your mask there, Beth, just to make sure that I get the same greeting. I I appreciate that. And so it was a sign of greeting and respect. In other places, it's just used as a sign of silliness, like that famous Einstein photo when he did not want to have his picture taken. And so in order to avoid, avoid the picture, they took this picture and it has become an iconic photograph over the years. Sometimes our tongues are stuck out just to be silly. And there are other times, like in the Maori culture, where people stick them out as a sign of war. Stick them out as a sign of war. Our tongues can get us into trouble. In fact, you may remember that famous line, loose lips sink. Loose lips sink ships. They sink relationships. They sink friendships. I've seen it happen. A friendship that had been nurtured and grown for years cut short from a few angry words, a few misplaced uses of the tongue. It can destroy relationships, it can destroy fellowship, and it can even destroy championships. Just ask Boris Becker. Boris Becker had completely beaten Andre, and I can't say his last name correctly, my tongue gets in the way, Agassi? Agassi. See, I can't say it right. My tongue trips me up. Andre Agassi. I'm going to just pause and you say it. Andre Andre Agassi could not beat Boris Becker. Try as he might, time after time, Becker won the day. And so Andre decided that he would study the tapes and try to figure out why he was getting beaten. And as he studied and studied and studied Boris Becker, he realized that when Becker was serving, he would stick his tongue out. He would just dart his tongue out quickly as he was preparing to serve. And if he stuck his tongue out straight, he was going to serve toward the body. If he stuck his tongue out To the left, he was going to serve over to the left-hand side of the court. He had a tell. He had a tick. He was showing people where the ball was going to go. And so Andre studied him. Andre studied him, and he said the hardest part was not letting him know that he knew. And so they would get out there on the court, and he would wait for the perfect moment to use it to take over the match, to take over the game. And he beat Becker 10 straight times after that. His final record against him was 10 and 3. He lost at Wimbledon, but you remember he won the 1990 U.S. Open, and he was able to do that because Becker's tongue betrayed him. He said the hardest thing, though, was not telling him, and he said one day we went to Oktoberfest, which is not a great place for the tongue. And he said, we were at Oktoberfest enjoying a pint together, and after a pint, I just had to tell him. He said, you know how I beat you all those times? Your tongue gave you away. Becker fell off his seat. He said, I have been telling my wife that you live in my head. I could not figure out. Every time I went out there, it was as though you knew exactly what I was going to do. And, I, and he said, I did. I knew exactly what you're going to do because your tongue betrayed you. Your tongue was giving you away. The writer of the book of James is concerned about the tongue, and he starts with other images. He starts with the image of a bit or a bridle, that small thing in regard to the shape and the size of a horse. And he says that little thing, that tiny thing, can control the whole horse. That bit in the horse's mouth can move the horse from one side to the other. That small rudder in the back of a large ship can control the direction of a ship. And the tongue, 
The tongue is a fire. The tongue is a flame that can set whole forests on fire. And as Smokey the Bear once said, only you, we all say it that way, only you can prevent forest fires. But I'll have you know that has not been the slogan of the fire prevention service. It has not been their slogan for 20 years. 20 years ago, they changed it to only you can prevent wildfires because many of the fires that we've seen in recent days came as wildfires and are not in our forests. So they changed that 20 years ago. And the other slip of the tongue that I made is calling him Smokey the Bear. His name is not Smokey the Bear. His name is Smokey Bear. Did you know that? His name is Smokey Bear, and he gets his origins from a time after December 7th, 1941. December 7th, 1941 was another time in American history where there was an invasion on U.S. soil. Just as we remembered yesterday, 20 years ago this day, December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. And many of the people who were firefighters joined the war effort. And so people from the forestry service were trying to figure out how can we get people to start less fires? We need to come up with some sort of public service announcement. We need to get people to stop starting fires and to be more conscious of their work out in the woods. And so they started campaigns and they said words like this, Your carelessness aids the enemy. Forest fires aid the enemy. Our carelessness is their secret weapon. I think James would say the same thing to us. I think James would say the same thing to us about our tongue, is our tongues can fight forest fires that aid the enemy, and that our carelessness with our tongues is the enemy's secret weapon. We need to be careful with our tongues. Back in 1942, when this was going on and they were trying to put this together, a movie came out, and uh, my third grader is going to have to help me with this one. A movie came out in 1942 from Walt Disney. Have you ever heard of Walt Disney? And it was about a deer, a baby deer. What was it called? Bambi is correct. It came out in 1942. Does anybody remember when it came out? I mean, Jerry Ray is 86 years old today, and so he would have been five or six when that came out, right, Jerry? You remember Bambi? And and Bambi was about forest creatures and was about protecting the forest. And you remember the famous fire in that. And Disney allowed the Forest Service to use their characters to try and wage a prevention campaign against forest fires. You remember what Thumper's mom said, don't you? What Thumper's mom said to everyone, if you can't say something Don't say anything at all. Sincerely, Thumper's mom. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. The problem with that campaign was Disney would only allow them to use their characters for one year. After a year, they took the characters back, and the Forest Service had to figure out another way to do it. And they're like, it worked with animals the last time. Let's find us an animal that we can use. So they took the stately, proud, and sometimes cute bear and came up with Smokey, not Smokey the bear, Smokey Bear. Look it up if you don't believe me, Smokey Bear, in order to try and reduce the number of forest fires, to prevent forest fires before they even happened. Only you can prevent forest fires. And so James wants us to be careful with how we use our tongues. And he does that like we as parents sometimes do this. Any of the third graders ever been told to hold your tongue? Have you ever been told that? Hold your tongue? Try it. You can even do it through your mask. Hold your tongue. It works really well. Because if you will hold your tongue, 
you can't say anything that will get you in trouble. Okay? So if you want to control your tongue, one of the things you could do is hold your tongue. That is one possibility. The other is you could just get some licorice and create a tongue lasso. Some of us need that, right? To be able to lasso it in. It's already out and you want to lasso it and get it back in. I personally am thankful that my computer has an undo command. I wish my tongue did. I talked with Pat Morgan this week and he said, Pat, are you out there? I talked with Pat Morgan this week, and he said that he sometimes writes emails that he shouldn't send. And his secret is he never puts a name in the box. He never puts a two person in the sender box, and then he can write them, and he never accidentally sends them to the wrong person, or sends them before he needs to, or sends them when he shouldn't send them at all. James is concerned that our tongues will get in the way. As Joe Martin likes to say, our tongues can tend to bend and to pretend, to defend and to offend and condescend. And whenever our tongues do any of those things, when we bend, when we bend the truth, when we defend things that we've done that are indefensible, when we offend by the words that we say, when we pretend to be something that we're not, when we condescend and speak down to people, our tongues are getting in the way. Our tongues have become a problem. I talked to Charlotte Crofton this week, and she said one of her uh, soccer players that she admires, when she gets into trouble and is about to say something she shouldn't, she said her, her, her soccer friend will take her fingers and just close her lips. Try that. That works. She said she just presses her lips tighter together to be able to make sure she doesn't say the thing that she wants to say. I personally, and some of you know this, I keep a prayer coin in my pocket. I keep a prayer coin in my pocket most all the time. It's got an angel on one side letting you know that I'm praying for you. And on the other side, it's got a flat sort of surface that I use as a worry stone. And it helps me from saying some things that might be fun to say, but I shouldn't say. You haven't ever done anything like that? It would have been fun to say that, but if you say that, you're going to sink a friendship or sink a relationship or sink good Christian fellowship. So I keep it in my pocket to remind me of things that I think I should say and so that I'll stick to my guns and say them. And I also keep it in my pocket to help me stop from saying something, to remain silent. You know that's true, friends. We have the right to remain silent, to be quiet for a few moments. Have any of you ever taken a vow of silence? Have any of you ever taken some time to really be silent for an extended period of time? Several years ago, I went on a spiritual life retreat, and on that spiritual life retreat, it started with 12 hours of silence. Can you imagine? It was terrible. 12 hours where I was supposed to be silent. I didn't have anything to listen to. I didn't have anyone to talk to. We were all to be silent for 12 hours. And I didn't get to sleep that whole time either. I had to be silent. And it was a time that God began to work in and through me in my silence. The story is told of a monk who decided to take a vow of silence. And they told him, you have to be silent all year, but at the end of the year, you get to say two words. So he spent that first year, and the head of the monastery invited him in, and he said, what are your two words? He said, better food. <laughs> so the abbot got a new chef and got better food for everyone. And then after the second year, he came back and he said, what are your two words? And he said, warmer blankets. So they bought warmer blankets for all the monks. After the third year of not speaking at all except for two words, they brought him in and they said, what are your two words this year? And he said, I quit. <laughs> and the abbot said, that's good because all you've done since you've been here is complain. It's 
strange thing happened this week, y'all. God moves in mysterious ways. But we have a suggestion box in the narthex in the activity center, and it fell and shattered. I personally am not a big fan of anonymous suggestions anyway. And we opened it up, and inside was a $5 bill. I don't know what you're suggesting with a $5 bill. I'd love to know what that was for. And four other suggestions, one dated December 24th, 2015. (laughs) We've been ignoring your suggestions. (laughs) I think Kathy's going to replace it with a prayer box. (laughs) But James has some serious suggestions for us today. James has some serious suggestions for each and every one of us. James wants us to hear that the tongue can be a problem. And he says, you've been able to tame all sorts of wild animals, but then no one can tame the tongue. And if that is true, then why even try? If that's true, why even try? Well, that's what the contemporary English Bible says, Christopher. It says, no one can tame the tongue. But what it really is saying is, no human being can tame the tongue. And that tends to be my experience. We as human beings have a hard time taming the tongue. But if you will let God have control over your tongue, there is a chance that your tongue can be tamed. That's what James says in the very beginning of this. He says, not many of you should be teachers because you will be held, Randolph, to a higher standard. You will be held to a higher standard if you come to be teachers because the weight of justice will be held upon you higher than anyone else. Are you willing to take that responsibility? It is a heavier burden for those of us who are called to teach. And yet those of us who then choose to teach will be held to a higher standard. And we should be held to a higher standard if we are going to be called to teach and take that choice to be able to lead other people. Our words matter. Our words matter. And if we're going to allow God to control our tongues and give over our control, one of the best ways that I know for that to happen is for us to take some time in silence. One writer decided that he would take a week of silence. Is anybody ready for a week of silence? I know you have some other people you'd like to have a week of silence. But he decided that he would try to be silent for a week. He wasn't totally silent because he had a job and he had to interact with people. So he wasn't totally silent. He just chose to be more silent one week. And as he chose to be more silent one week, he said it was incredible what happened. He said the more silent he was, when he did talk, more people listened. He said he heard things that he had been missing in conversations because he was too busy talking and too busy trying to figure out what he was going to say. And then he said this, he said, and I didn't say anything stupid all week. (laughs) That may may, may just be worth trying. To have more silence in our lives. And if we would afford more silence for God, perhaps then God would be able to rewrite our source code. And in rewriting our source code, would be able to allow to have something different come up out of us. Karen Amon, who I was talking about early, earlier with her book, Keep It Shut, she gives this advice. Pause before you pounce. Turn to somebody near you and give that advice. Pause before you pounce. I would add pray before you pounce. And then she goes on to say, don't say something permanently painful just because you're temporarily ticked. You like that? Don't say something permanently painful just because you are temporarily ticked. What James is saying is, that you cannot get both fresh water and salt water from the same source. And there must be something wrong with the source if you are able to bless God with your mouth here on Sunday mornings 
and tear down and belittle people who are made in the image of God the rest of the week. If you have a problem with your mouth, you may have a heart condition. If you have a problem with what comes out of you, it may reside much deeper within, and that is what James is concerned about. Many of us engage in what they call a breath prayer, and I breathe in, and I breathe out, and I breathe in, create in me a clean heart, O God, and as I breathe out, renew a right spirit within me. That's called a breath prayer. Third graders, I'd like you to try a bad breath prayer, okay? Do you know how you get bad breath? Anybody? My third graders, do you know how you get bad breath? How? You don't brush your teeth. And so I want you, when you brush your teeth this week, and the next week, and the next week, I'd like you to say a prayer for your tongue. So I'd like you to brush your teeth, and then brush your tongue. And ask God to be in charge of your tongue that day. Does that sound like a good idea? Are there any adults who might need to try that? (laughs) To let God be in charge of your tongue. To take 10 minutes in the morning and have enough silence in your life for God to be able to speak. And so you're not always the one talking. Maybe you need an hour this week where you are silent and you listen for God to speak to you. Maybe you need a whole day of silence. Maybe you can join Kathy on a retreat at the Ignatius Center. It's only five miles from here. And uh, Elizabeth, you know what that's like. You go on retreat and for a half day or a whole day or even a weekend, if you really need to clean up your source code, you might want to spend some time in silence. And then when you do break your silence, you're able to say something that is not a tongue twister at all. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. It sure is easier than pad kid, poured curd, pulled cod. May we allow God to tame our tongues in the days ahead. One of the things that parents will often tell their kids is bite your tongue. Have you ever heard that? Bite your tongue. You know that actually works. Scientifically, if you will bite your tongue, it will allow your brain to have more power and allow you to think more clearly. That's why Boris Becker would do that. That's why people will bite their tongue when they're intently studying or thinking about something. They bite their tongues and allows them to think more clearly, which is a wonderful thing to do before you speak. May we entrust our tongues, the things we say and the things we do not say, to the one who created us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand and lift your voices in our closing hymn. As we lift our voices together, let us praise God, praise God, praise God.
I do want to say a word of thank you for your suggestions. They were all pretty positive. <laughs> Most of them were uplifting and trying to help us with things that might need to be fixed around here. Someone said, let's turn the welcome desk into a coffee shop. That was one of the suggestions. So I don't know what you need to do this week, whether you need to hold your mouth closed like Charlotte's friend, whether you need to bite your tongue so you can concentrate, or whether you just need to hold the tongue. Whatever it might be, may you allow God more control over your tongue in the days ahead so that we can be the people of God we thought we were on 912. Do you remember that? Do you remember how it felt to be a unified people working together? Help us to be people of peace. Help us to be people that aren't starting fires, but that we are those who help bind other people together in love by the way that we use our tongues. May you now lift your voices and sing of the peace that we all dream of here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen and amen. <laughs> 